I've been around and doing it, but now it's my time to shine and start proving it. I'm losing it, I'm moving it. The city is where I'm made, Bostonian flow. I kick it a back day, yeah, I got game. Got in a fan way, we the city of the champs. Every sport we play, spin wetter than the harbor, yeah. I'm flowing like the Charles. I be speeding on this beat, call it turnpike miles. Yeah, it's Google signing on, John to the Hancock, and I'm always key. I'm ready to unlock. I be doing big things, don't even have a deal, yeah. I battle through these. Welcome back, everyone, to the newest edition of Once a Week. I'm Billy Janalutis, and today we've got an incredible, incredible special guest, someone that I had the privilege of going to school with back in the day, and she's been a traveler ever since, but she has also become the millennial dog owner. She's bringing people the knowledge, the resources, and all the information someone would need to make their life with a dog that much better. And I thought, that's phenomenal. I got to get her on here because she's making a huge impact. So guys, I give you Ashley Cipolletti. Ashley, thank you. Hi. Yeah, thanks for that intro. It was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Had to do it right for you back in the day. <laughs> no, like seriously, I appreciate you being here. And it's funny, like you're doing all this cool stuff with animals. And I was thinking back when I see you posting this content, I can remember us sitting in Mrs. K Mrs. Carroll's science class freshman year. <laughs> and me and you would talk about different types of animals just to kind of past the time because you know we didn't want to do the work and um at the time we talked about horses because i think that was just one of your favorite animals yep you built that on dogs and how did all this come about where you're now training people with dogs and posting all this content yeah i know it's a great question so my whole life i've been um i don't know i've had dogs i've also like rode horses my whole life mm -hmm. and i was doing horse training for a while and then found that there was just a lot of techniques that were kind of harsh um, and like borderline abusive that people use with horses. And then I got a job at the Humane Society where it's mostly dogs and cats, but other animals too. Um, I just learned a kinder approach to working with animals and then um, tried to also kind of do that with horses simultaneously. Mm -hmm. But the work with dogs just kind of took the forefront for me. And I felt like more people have dogs than horses, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, I don't know, that kind of like started, I guess, the dog aspect. That's awesome. That's so cool. Yeah. You know, and just in us talking prior to hitting record on this video, it, you kind of carried over your work just in general into dogs where you're working now on the mental health side with kids, young mm -hmm. adults, you said? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So talk yeah. So like, I feel like it's very similar working with like trauma or anxiety or any, or even like depression, animals have that too. Um, and so a lot of the techniques we call it like behavior modification, yep. we use that with people. And we also use that with uh, dogs specifically in training. Yep. So it's really fascinating. I'm like, the things I'm learning in mental health counseling, I feel like translate so easily over to the dog world. It's so true. And I, you know, I love how you point that out too, because you know, I work with the young adult population as well in the mental health field. And you mentioned to me before body language and how you can now read the body language of a dog and you know, work in the mental health field, you're able to read the body language of a person. Mm -hmm. How do you make that connection where you're working with a dog and like, wait a second, I can tell that it's extremely stressed out or anxious right now. How did that come about? Yeah, well, one of it was just a lot of education and training. Um, at the Humane Society, they go through extensive training with that. So that was awesome. And then just through experience too, like you can, you can pick up on when dogs are like kind of coming into your space with like loose wiggly body language versus when they're like leaning away trying to create space away from you and people do that too if like their arms are crossed they're trying to walk away they look away versus direct eye contact like smiling coming into your space it's just picking up on when you can push a little bit and when is pushing is too much yeah okay that makes a ton of sense right there and Given the fact that the state of the world right now with COVID and everything, are you seeing more people come to you with training questions? Because I feel like at least up here, I know you're on the other side of the continent right now, you know, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know the rescue dogs, like all the rescues are gone. Like everyone has them all. They, they're trying to save dogs. They're trying to get a dog around them because of COVID struggling. People need that, that uh, companion aspect. Mm -hmm. When that happened, are you seeing more people looking for the answers that you're bringing to them? Yeah, I feel like there's definitely been an increase in separation anxiety because people aren't going to work anymore. So 
if you're constantly home and your dog's only experience with you is you being around all the time and then one day you leave to go hang out with a friend or say you do have to go back to work now your dog doesn't know how to be alone so that's been one of my main things people struggle with and then just a huge increase in everyone getting puppies right now i feel like all like 90 percent of my clients are puppies right now <laughs> i gotcha yeah i know that that's where the, all the training comes in and the recent content you've been posting and i'm gonna everyone watching this right now i'm gonna put her instagram at the end of this but the content you've been posting are I'm learning from it just in training my dog who I've had for like 12 years who, you know, yeah. see if you learn some of the lessons, which I think, <laughs> you will. but you know, with the puppies, that's a huge training aspect right there that I think people yeah. need to hop on to. Yeah. And, and you can definitely do um, training at any age. It's just with puppies. Like they, um, I, I guess you have to kind of just shape their environment and try and make everything as positive as you can. So to hopefully like not have those fearful behaviors come up, but you can work with any dog of any age and work on counter conditioning fears that they might have, making them more comfortable, um, or you can teach them new tricks, but I'm more about the behavior aspect. I think tricks are fun for enrichment, but I'm not like trying to be like some, you know, dog competitor with doing tricks and things like that. So <laughs> I try and just focus on living comfortably with your dog. So dogs yeah. don't go back into shelters and things like that. That's awesome. I see. I, I love that so much more. Like, you know, yeah. <laughs> if my dog ever rolled over. I, I don't know if I'll ever see it. Like, right. He, he's a bulldog. He'll get stuck on his back. Like oh, yeah. Dog, I don't even know, know if physically they can. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I, I love how you approach it with a behavioral aspect, because at the end of the day, we you don't get a dog so it could do a trick. You get a dog because you want to be part of your home, your family. Mm -hmm. And for you to take that approach, that's going to make that connection for that goal so much more with whoever the owner is. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. And just finding ways of like, okay, this whining might be annoying you. Well, what's the cause of the whining? And your dog clearly is distressed enough to start whining. So maybe we need to add more enrichment, more mental stimulation, more walks. Um, so it's kind of like a puzzle and trying to figure out what pieces that we can add or take away that can help, um, I guess, modify that behavior that usually yeah. people from traditional training would just be like, oh, correct the problem, like right. yell at your dog for doing that. But yelling at someone who has anxiety is just going to increase their anxiety, not decrease it. So yeah. same thing with dogs. <laughs> and that's all, that's one of the main reasons I wanted to get you on a once a week episode, because that right that little piece of information right there it's like if you yell at a person they're gonna have the same response that you're yelling at a dog and everyone that gets a dog mm -hmm. i don't say everyone i hope there's good people out there but you know, <laughs> their first response is always a dog does something wrong i yell at it and then that's that but right. the approach you have like the connections there and you're you're bringing all this knowledge this information to people you know what sparked you to get that like as much I know you I know you love dogs you work with humane society you work with people what was the first idea you had a light bulb goes off where people need this information I'm going to start spreading it to help people but I'm going to help these dogs as well yeah um well I mean when I moved to San Diego there's so many dogs out here like everybody has dogs and they don't I feel like on the east coast it's more like people kind of leave their dogs at home and go about their lives and whatever but in San Diego, people bring their dogs with them everywhere. Like it does not matter where you are. There's always dogs there. And I was just seeing all of these um, just kind of sad ways that people were correcting behavior. They're either like closing their dog's muzzle with their hands if they bark. They're, uh, their dog's reacting out of fear and they're bringing it closer to the thing it's scared of. And I'm just like, people need, I think, a little guidance because they don't know. No one's like, let me just traumatize my dog. Like people think they're doing what's best. Yeah. So I kind of started it as just like a, if I can help one dog have an owner that something clicks, that's mm -hmm. awesome. And then um, just kind of like grew from there. Yeah, exactly. And then that, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. If you can have one person or one dog, like mm -hmm. that's all it takes and it's, it sparks it. Um, yeah. So I love that right there. And, you know, your, let's talk about your, your, like you mentioned, your work with the Humane Society. What's some other key factors you learned from them that you take into like your everyday aspect of training, helping a family or training a dog for that matter? What's some key topics that you could bring to people right now? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, one of it too is just before you even bring a dog home, thinking realistically about your lifestyle and what kind of dog would complement your lifestyle versus going just off of looks, which obviously to a certain degree, 
people do pick dogs off of looks. Yep. Um, but thinking about, okay, if I have this dog that is really high energy, super smart, it's a working dog breeds. So these are like border collies, Australian mm -hmm. shepherds, even German shepherds. And you're like, oh yeah, I'm a couch potato. I hardly leave my house. Right. You're going to set that dog up to fail because they have more needs that can't be met from you. So I just try and encourage people to think more seriously about what kind of dog would actually fit their lifestyle. And there are middle-aged dogs or older dogs that are happy being a couch potato of any breed. Sure. Um, but you have to be realistic with that. So that's kind of, that's one. Yep. Um, another one is just not to like push your expectations on your dog. Yep. So, um, and just accepting them for who they are. So if you have a dog, for example, my dog, Sadie, she's not great with other dogs. When I first got her, she was super fearful really scared of men and other dogs specifically. Got to the point now where she's great with men, all people, uh, yeah. but meeting other dogs very unsure. And then it can real, can kind of develop into a potential dog fight. So just don't set her up for that. Yeah. But I won't take her to the beach with me if I'm like playing volleyball with my friends. I'm not gonna bring her because everyone else's dogs are there. Okay. That's gonna set her up for failure. So I kind of just accept her for where she's at and try and manage her environment to support her instead of set her up for failure. That's awesome. Um, so it's like kind of another tip. And then probably my last tip I would say for or from what I learned at the Humane Society, is just realizing that not every dog wants to be pet and touched. So if you're walking along the street and you see people's dogs, don't just assume like, hey, I can go up to this dog and pet them. Yeah. Um, you can ask the owner first, or you can just ignore a dog that's showing signs of fear. So that could be like their ears are back, their um, tails tucked between their legs. Like, don't try and approach that dog. You're probably scaring it. So just be humble and, and give it space. Yeah, that's huge right there. And that's, I think that's all the, the facts people overlook, you know, and mm -hmm. just the, the environment question for that matter, the first one you gave us it, um, you know, I'm sitting there and like, you're right, a lot of people go for a dog because of the look. And mm -hmm. I think I've always want a Siberian Husky, because it, mm -hmm. looks like, it looks like the wolf, it's got the beautiful eyes, everything is incredible. Right. And you sit there and, you know, if I'm at work X amount of hours throughout the day, that dog's got to exercise. That's a massive dog. And they're known for being out and about doing their thing. And, you know, um, <laughs> you can't make it happen, but right. <laughs> you, you got to take that into account. Like, all right, I can't have what I want right now, maybe someday. But if more people come into that, I think that's going to help so many dogs, one for that matter, feel so accepted with the people they do get with, because the right. family, you're going to understand the dog that much more. Right. And if you already have a dog that and you kind of already were just like, crap, I got this dog and I'm realizing now I'm struggling meeting its needs. There are ways to like modify and make it, you know, as best as you can without having to necessarily rehome the dog. Um, but it's just being honest with that. So do what you can try and do training, add more enrichment, um, maybe get a trainer, do dog daycare. You can there's tons of things that you can try. Yeah. So I would say like prevent it if you can, like just be kind of try and be mindful before you bring a dog home of, you know, your lifestyle. And then if you've, if it's a little too late and you're finding this dog is too challenging, seek out those resources. Um, usually adding enrichment, which means like um, some chew toys, lick mats, snuffle mats. You can even do like scent work with your dog in the home. All these things that work their brain can help prevent a ton of behavior problems because Usually like if your brain's exhausted, you're kind of like, all right, I'm going to take a nap. Yeah. Um, you're engaged. It's like doing math problems all day. Yeah. Like you're tired. <laughs> it's exactly. Better than being bored all day. <laughs> yeah, that's huge too. And I, I love how you, you bring it back to that, the mental aspect, because that's how humans interact too. It's like, we need to be working. If we're tired in one area, we got to go work a different area. It's like, if I'm tired at work or if I haven't, if I, I'm in the gym for that matter, I can only work my body as much as I can. I gotta go work my mind and the right. dog has so many different avenues of the mind that it has to work so it can operate the way it should operate for that matter you know it's right and a lot of people I think focus primarily on the physical exercise and like that's an aspect but you also can create like a mega athlete too so you're like yeah. the more exercise you're giving your dog the more they might need to like I don't know I guess match that so it's kind of like with people if we're going to the gym constantly you can plateau and yeah. then you might need to like do more to your workout so you could be creating a dog that needs even more exercise by doing that so it's a fine fine balance 
Um, obviously they need physical exercise. Let them have like go for sniff walks too, but chewing and licking naturally are very calming behaviors to dogs. Mm. So if your dog's like anxious walking around, sometimes just giving them a Kong toy with peanut butter in it, or just like a fun chew can help um, significantly with boredom um, or with like them pacing, whining, that kind of thing. Cause it just naturally produces calming hormones and yeah. they need to chew. It's part of their I feel like instinct too. <laughs> Definitely. That makes so much sense. When people come to you and, you know, they're looking either for to have you become a trainer or to just information for that matter. What's like, what do you find is like the top three things people are bringing to you? Question. Well, we just went over some important things that you learned in the humane society, but mm -hmm. what's some top questions you're finding from more or the most common questions for that matter that you're finding from people? Yeah, um, I would say a lot of people come to me with issues of their dog barking. So that could be like barking at people who walk by, come into the home or like reacting on walks. So that looks like lunging, barking, kind of just being like crazy bananas on leash. Um, that's probably number one. And then the other top things I'd say are either separation anxiety or I'm trying to think like uh, maybe just like dog to dog interactions and how to do that safely. Okay. How do you help people in those areas? Yeah. Uh, so barking is, is probably challenging to like come up with a solution over like a video because it just depends on the dog, on the circumstance, the context of the situation. So many reasons for barking. Yeah. Um, and reactivity is one of the more challenging things to like train with a dog. And it's really just counter conditioning their brain to see things they're reacting to and make a choice of, okay, I could sit here and look at my owner instead. I get a treat for that. So I can look at these like scary or exciting things, but when I'm calm, that's the behavior I'm supposed to do as opposed to like jerking your dog back, your dog's like embarrassing you, you're frustrated. No training's going to happen when your dog's at a level 10. You have to get them to at, like, at least a level five or a six yeah. before you can really move forward. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. That's a perfect <laughs> answer because, you know, it, like I love how you said if your dog's embarrassing you, like that takes the human side of it into it because if you're taking dog for a walk, it's barking at someone and you're like, oh no, how could this happen? Like, why? Come on. And you're just starting to pull it. Your anxiety goes to the roof because you're in a Absolutely. situation you to be in but you're not helping it at all by yanking the dog. You're probably worsening the situation for that. Absolutely. And yeah. people just don't know. So they're like, why is this happening? And I think there's a lot of pressure for dog parents to be like, you need to train your dog, be on top of it, not let this dog like over or walk all over you. So you're kind of like, everyone's looking at me, expecting me to train my dog that's misbehaving right now. Mm -hmm. And then people meet that with, I'm going to pull the dog back. I'm going to yell at it, like show that I'm trying, like that I'm not an irresponsible dog owner. Um, but they're really missing the whole reason why behind your dog is acting that way. And usually it's from fear or frustration, mm -hmm. um, but like usually mostly fear. Um, but it, it depends on the dog and context. And so if you're meeting someone who's having basically a panic attack, human, dog, horse, doesn't matter, the animal, and you're meeting that with jerking them back, your anxiety's up, you're just adding fuel to the fire. Yeah. You're not taking it. And then people are usually continuing to walk to the thing that they're reacting to when you should be creating space until they're calm enough away and can take a deep breath and be like, okay, my panic attack's over. Yeah. Um, but instead we're like, let's take, like, let's just make this worse and bring you closer to the scary thing and people don't look at it that way. They just are like, I'm going on my walk. This is the route we go on. Yeah. Um, so it's just really teaching people like, this is why your dog's acting this way. Here's a better idea. Here's how to keep them calm and how to reinforce calm behavior. That's awesome. That's huge right there. And you know, yeah. it, it brings up another question that we, um, we talked about before we hit the record one. And I gave you a little <laughs> example of a, a dog situation that I've been dealing with or a friend of mine has been dealing with for that matter. And and it's funny because you say that one of your biggest areas that you love to help dogs with is that anxiety, that trauma aspect. Mm -hmm. Let's dive into that for a second, because I think more often than not, that pops up in people, but it pops mm -hmm. up in animals. And I think a lot of people overlook that it pops up in animals. Mm -hmm. Explain that for us, the trauma in a dog and how someone could start to help their dog in a trauma area or whatever. Yeah. Absolutely. So I would say first thing I would want to note 
is that trauma in dogs can start from things that we might not see as traumatizing. So we automatically go into, oh, this dog's fearful, he was probably abused. That's not always true. Sometimes trauma can develop from a scary noise and they just reacted to it like, what the hell was that? And they're not able to cope from it. So a dog can even develop tra like trauma from, let's say a truck drives by and the first time they ever were exposed to a truck, that's terrifying. And now every time they hear a truck, they freak out, they're starting to bark, yeah. you know, whatever from that. Um, and also if they're not socialized from a young age with lots of different people, lots of different um, environments, noises, things like that. Um, dogs are contextual learners, so they have to meet people of all shapes and sizes, genders, races, everything. Otherwise, when they're faced with a new one that they haven't seen, they're going to probably respond with fear. Um, so that can be one thing. So if a dog wasn't socialized properly, maybe they grew up with only a female household. Now they see a male, they're gonna be like, oh my gosh, this thing's so scary and they're gonna bark or run away from it. Fear can look different. And sometimes fear can um, kind of manifest into a, aggression that people would say too. Um, so that's one thing to note. And then when you're working with fearful dogs or anyone with trauma, it's just going slow and at their own pace, being uh, very, very patient, I think is the number one thing. Mm -hmm. And I just try to like be humble and realize like I can be scary. Like I'm not gonna like be like, oh yeah, I'm this dog trainer, no matter what this dog's gonna like me. I'm okay with having a day where we don't make progress necessarily. We can sit there, share the same space, but that's how trust is developed, is being consistent, patient, and basically not scary. So I'm not gonna push the dog to the point where he feels he needs to bite or growl or do any of these bigger warning signs. I'm gonna give him his space. He can come into mine and I'm not gonna react just to prove that I'm very predictable and not scary. And that's a way to develop trust instead of, reaching over, petting the dog, kind of like almost overwhelming it with how we show love is not necessarily how they receive love. So yeah. <laughs> just kind of uh, being humble in that aspect. Yeah, that's huge right there. Cause you know, dogs don't, you know, they could receive love the way we see re receive love, but right. if people see that difference right there, that makes a world of difference in how you approach your dog. Right. And everyone's like, oh, dogs love me. And I'm like, that's great that you think that. But some dogs, no matter what, because you are a human being, are going to be terrified of you. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> you can take that like most dogs love me. That's great. But when you're you meet one that it does not love you, that's yeah. OK. It's not like you did anything wrong. It's just meeting the dog where they're at yeah. and being patient. I get that. OK, that makes a ton of sense right there. I, I love how you again, I've said it probably 10 times in this. I love how you approach <laughs> dogs in the with it, in the trauma aspect. And it, like you said, a dog could have trauma from anything. You know, it could it could be a mm -hmm. could, like a, a car driving by when it was a puppy mm -hmm. so that could set the tone for it. But if, I think if more people are looking to get a dog or looking to integrate a dog into the family, for that matter, there's a whole lot more questions that people need to be asking before that can actually happen. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I love how you're bringing this to people because it's, it's, it's needed more now than ever because of COVID. Like we said before, like more people are getting dogs now just for the separation anxiety. So your information, your resources are going to be needed a whole lot more in the coming months, years. And for that matter, it's huge. Yeah. And I feel like once everyone does go back into work and their normal life, they're going to see, probably another another wave of yeah. um, needing help with some behavioral like issues or you see a lot of destructive behavior too or people will leave and then their dog will like have an accident on the floor and they're like oh I took you out and it's like that dog might not have had to necessarily go to the bathroom it's usually like if you are having a lot of fear or anxiety being alone it's like a natural response in the body to do that. Yeah. So instead of like punishing your dog for that, when you come home to a mess, it's usually how they're trying to self-soothe their anxiety about being alone. Mm, that makes a ton of sense right there. Yeah, that's huge. Now, million dollar question, since you work <laughs> with people and you work with dogs, what do you like working more with? The people <laughs> or the dogs? <laughs> well, <laughs> great question. When it's when it's dog training, I prefer working with the dogs because every person has their own like very strong beliefs on who their dog is and why their dog's too stubborn or too smart for training to work. Yeah. And I'm like, no, that's not true. It's just the execution and the finesse and communicating clearly. Every dog is trainable like yeah. easily. It's just communicating clearly. Yeah. Um, but when I work with like in my full-time job with um, my human clients, 
I love working with them too. So it's like, it's just different, I guess. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I'm like, it's just like, I guess if people are open to feedback and open to learning, that's who I like, like interacting with the most. It's hard to try and teach or coach someone who's closed off to the idea of it. Cause you're never going to change if you're not open to it. It's true. Yeah. It's a hundred percent true. That's awesome right there. <laughs> can't figure side. Figure side. <laughs> right. I know. I'm like, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a perfect answer. Uh, but no, I, I love how you're taking the approach that you have with, with dogs, being the millennial dog owner. How can, well, let me ask you this. Where do you see the millennial dog owner going? Are you getting more clientele? Yeah. Are you trying to spread it more, uh, helping more dogs? Like where do you, where, where is that idea of yours going? Yeah, well, I really want to create my own uh, blog post and website and then eventually want to have my own business um, that could be like, I can do Zoom consultations, I can do my own like more private training and really growing in that. Um, right now, my training is mostly within the company that I'm working for. And then just like using my Instagram kind of started more for fun. And then now it's like kind of growing into like, oh, I could almost create a brand from this and maybe that could be like where that kind of that path leads. So I'm just yeah. open to whatever, but hoping it goes that direction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I can see it definitely going there. Have you done any Zoom trainings at all recently? Um, Like here and there, like it's more just for my friends, I guess. I've had a lot of friends who've had dogs they've had questions about, um, but as far as like strangers or people I don't know, it's mostly through my the company I work for. Yep. Um, but as far as like that one-on-one -on -one or Zoom stuff, I'm doing that mostly with my friends. And you can totally do training over Zoom because yep. it's like you're you're teaching the people how to train their own dog and observing it. It's just like they're not seeing you necessarily work with their dog. But things like separation anxiety, you you can't train that you being there anyways. So that's super easy to do over Zoom. Definitely. That, that's huge right there. Cause at the end of the day, you're not going to be there the whole point of that dog's life. The, the right. person is coming to you is. And I think that's awesome. If you start to use zoom as a tool and why I asked that question is because like, I was going to ask, are you doing it now? Because I'm about to throw your name out there to so many people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I would love to. Yeah. I'm like, I mean, I am open to anything and everything. So yes. <laughs> awesome. Well, you got, you guys just heard from Ashley right there. If you have a question about a dog, She's open to doing a Zoom interview with you yeah, right now. Yeah, I love, I love to help people. I love to help dogs. So yeah. definitely won't say no to that. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm going to put that at the end of this video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seriously. But okay, last couple of questions. Sure. Um, we've gone over the trauma. We've gone over the anxiety that dogs feel. We've gone over the, the stress level that humans feel for that matter. Mm -hmm. You've gone over so many resources, how you came about those resources, the Humane Society, so much. What's one final point that you think everyone needs to know when they're not even when they're getting a the dog, just when they have a dog, what's something, one of the most important pieces that you learned in all the animals that you've had, whether it's a horse, whether it's a dog, you know, what's mm -hmm. something important that you should bring to people right now? Um, so I guess I kind of two things. So one, I kind of talked about earlier, but just setting your dog up or your pet up doesn't matter what animal it is for success instead of failure. So just teaching ourselves to be proactive instead of reactive. And how can you, um, I guess, plan ahead. And this, I first learned with horses as a kid, because horses are so large, if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile and they'll walk all over you. <laughs> so you kind of have to like scan your environment and be able to predict when things might happen and how to prevent it before you're dealing with this thousand pound animal having a, a large reaction. Yeah. Same goes for dogs or really people. So it's just looking for your environment and being like, okay, I'm going to set my dog up to succeed by, for example, like my dog will howl when left alone. I live in an apartment. That's not great. So I can do counter conditioning, but I can also do like, if I give her, it's called a lick mat with some peanut butter on it. Yep. I give that to her before I leave the licking calms her brain down when I leave. So she's not staring at the door being like, I'm sad and howling. Yeah. She's more like doing her own thing. And then when she's done, she takes a nap and I'm like, cool this has worked, you know, we fixed that problem. Um, so I guess just again, preventing instead of being like, oh, my dog's howling, I'm gonna get kicked out of my apartment. I don't know what to do. I'm just trying to prevent that from happening. Yeah. And then another thing, um, like kind of lost my train of thought with that, but um, <laughs> oh, another thing is just advocating for your pet. So you know them best usually. And if you know like your dog's gonna be uncomfortable by being touched or by being around kids, 
we have a lot of societal pressure from like people um, to be polite or to allow like people, everyone to touch your dog, but really just being your dog's advocate and saying like, no, he's, you know, not feeling comfortable right now, or you can exaggerate it. <laughs> like I've had dogs that are super fearful. They don't revert to biting, but I tell people, oh, this is really aggressive dogs. It's the only thing that will get them to back off. Mm -hmm. And then I have yeah. my fearful dog now being able to walk like, you know, on the boardwalk without everybody trying to touch it, or you can get vests that say like, you know, I'm nervous or whatever. Um, I don't normally like putting labels on dogs, but sometimes that label will make other people not approach the dog and will make them feel more comfortable. Yeah. Okay. That's huge right there. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so much, so a wealth of information is in it. <laughs> you know, um, final question. We mentioned the Instagram account, but is there anywhere else that people can come to you to get in contact with you if they want to set up a, a Zoom interview or if they live near you to come do an, uh, a training aspect? How can yeah. I mean, I think that Instagram for now is probably the best way. I'm trying to eventually get my own website, but I also want to teach myself how to make a website first. So like, this yeah. is just a learning experience for me that will take some time, but Instagram would be best. Or if it was just direct, like phone number or Facebook, that's fine too. Yeah. Um, but I feel like Instagram DMs, that would be perfect. Okay, perfect. And you guys just heard it right then there in the credits, you're going to see her Instagram. And then if you need to reach out to her and you want to set up a, a dog training aspect with Ashley, she's open to it. She just went over all the information <laughs> to give you, but Ashley, I thank you so much for being here. There's a, I, 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 yeah. get, I think you're the information you're bringing to people is so needed now more than ever, which is why I wanted you to do this interview. And I thank you for doing it. And you know, if, by all means, I'm going to be sending people to you left and right now. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. And I love talking about dogs and animal behavior and anything with mental health. So I'm like, this is right up my alley. <laughs> 100%. No, 100%. Next time you're on, we'll talk about human mental health and see how we Right, can yeah, love that too. Just love behavior. <laughs> exactly. That's awesome. But guys, you just heard it here. You're going to be able to find the millennial dog owner right on Instagram. I'm going to send you that over. And if you need it, have any questions, send them to me. I can get you in contact with Ashley right then and there. And you can train your dog, however you may will. But guys, as always, like this message on YouTube. Let's get, hit that thumbs up button. Share this message to someone who needs it. If Ashley was saying something, if I was saying something during this video and someone popped in your head or a dog popped in your head for that matter, that's a clear cut sign that that person, that owner, it needs to hear what Ashley's saying right now. Get them in contact with Ashley watch this video and send it to them. Hit the subscribe button. Let's get that number up and share it to more people. And as always, I know I don't really work with dogs, but if you or anyone you know is in need of a life coach, go to billygelifecoaching.com. You can set up a free consultation with me. And I'll be right then and there for you. But Ashley, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thank you to have me. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> have a good one, guys. I've been around and doing it But now it's my time to shine and start proving it I'm losing it, I'm moving it The city is wearing me